<laughs> Welcome to What Do You Know on KGVO. We are honored to have his honor here on our show this morning, Mayor John Angan. Welcome. Thank you. The honor is all mine. Welcome to KGVO. You know, John, you've been mayor here, as you know, for 10 years. The most popular elected official in the state. I think the last time you had somebody run against you, you got 66% of the vote. So we want to know a little bit about how this happened, how you got <laughs> through your life to this point. This is like, do you remember that, that Ralph Edwards show, This Is Your Life? I do indeed. Well, yeah. we're going to try to make this a, a sort of a replica of that, a mini radio version of this is, this is Your Life. Fair enough. So let me lay the rules of engagement for this show. Done. We're like Fight Club. There aren't any rules. Okay, so, but in, in fairness, since we're a station of journalistic integrity and higher moral purpose, and we're kind of the media compass for the community, we're not going to ask you about certain things. We're not going to ask you about the Montana water, Carlisle saga. I won't ask you about your you know, bariatric surgery in which you've lost 120 pounds or so, although I am sort of disappointed, frankly, that... We now have half a mayor. I voted for a whole mayor. And we kind of have a half a mayor now, and I'm, I'm jealous. I'm jealous and, and angry at the same time. So that's sort of the rules, and we want to make sure you agreed with what, how we're going to, the premise of moving forward. As, okay? I, as I tell my staff, I'll sign anything. Good. So then, what the hell is going on with Montana Water? <laughs> and you know, what, what happened there? Well, just give us, give us the, the scoop on that. All right. So... so for purposes of clarity, it's Mountain Water Company, right. which is uh, has been a uh, subsidiary of a California company called Park Water Company, which has been a subsidiary of a fund called Carlisle Infrastructure Partners, which right. is a subsidiary of Carlisle Group. Um, we have been engaged in... Um, in uh, pursuit of owning a mountain water company now for uh, quite some time. Um, we are, I hope, nearing the end of a legal battle um, that will allow us on behalf of the citizens of the city of Missoula to own that uh, precious utility. Um, there have been what I describe as uh, shenanigans. I have been um, fairly- That's a good word, shenanigans. Yeah, I've been fairly vocal about it. Um, T today, um, today the, the company is uh, is allegedly owned by um, by another investment fund that Out operates Canada. utilities, Out right? Can yeah. So, so Algonquin is um, the parent company. They operate a U.S. subsidiary called Liberty Utilities, um, and Liberty says they own Mount Water today. Can we chart this on today? the wall because it's already confusing? Oh, oh believe me, it requires a it requires a flow flow chart, um, and frankly, it's required a, a quite a number of uh, attorneys. Fortunately, we have uh, very good ones. Um, we believe that um, we believe that the other side has uh, misstepped um, and that based on our <clears throat> previous um, court rulings, we're where we need to be and we're going to own a water company. Well, that's good. You know, as I recall, there was a time where we thought this was going to all be done by 2013, but the shenanigans, as you put it, has kind of let put roadblocks in the whole process, hasn't right. it? Right, yeah. When, you know, and what Carlisle had said fairly early on is that they intended to defend this lawsuit vigorously, mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, that uh, I think, has translated into to time and money. Um, but um, this is not about me or the city council. Um, it is about uh, the future of Missoula. And we are the single uh, municipality mm -hmm. in the state that uh, does not own and operate its own water utility. Right. It's not as if this is some uncommon it's, phenomenon. It's, it's, it's very across it's, the state. Across the across state. Across the country. Yeah. And so, I'm, you know, and, and, you know, I'm not interested in scare attacks. This is just a fundamental utility that makes sense in the in the public realm, um, but you can see places where um, where there are problems with water around right. the country, and um, Missoula does not need to be one of those places, and water does not need to be a commodity, and there is no reason for any of us to believe that um, over time, with changes in laws, regulation, and as water becomes ever more precious, that a private company would be much more inclined to commoditize that precious resource right. and sell it than a municipality would, and that is fundamental. What, tell, tell me, I'm new to town, fairly new to town. When did the saga start? When did this whole initiative start with 
with water. So I was originally, uh, I originally began conversations with Robert Dove of the Carlisle Group about purchasing mountain water as part of a larger transaction that mm-hmm. Carlisle was involved in uh, in 2010. So Carlisle bought uh, bought mountain water um, and its sister companies in California from a guy named Sam Wheeler, uh, who had operated them for decades, um, and uh, that transaction. Um, was uh, consummated in 2011, mm-hmm. and we began. Frankly, our support for that sale was predicated on my conversation with Mr. Dove, um, that allowed us to um, purchase the system from Carlisle. They were they were interested in California, and they still are interested in California. And I believe that Liberty is most interested in California as well, because there is a lot of money to be made in the California water market. Mm. Who have been the toughest critics of this plan? Uh, you know, it's been a mixed bag, um, and and I don't expect folks um, to to blindly. Um, uh, uh, follow me in every direction. So what we have tried to do over the course really of the last four years is educate educate people as to why uh, municipal ownership makes more sense. Um, Judge Karen Townsend in her decision granting the preliminary order of condemnation um, really lays out a great case for why it makes sense for the sure. city to own this <clears throat> facility. Um, uh, you know, occupational hazard of being mayor of any place is there are critics. Um, occupational hazard of being mayor of Missoula is um, you might have more uh, <laughs> in some cases, sure. depending on the day. Um, but, you know, that's part of my job. And I I was hired to make change and I was hired to lead. Um, and I have a job application that I fill out every four years. And right. if I'm not the person, then I get sent packing. Right. And so far, most popular. I mean, every other politician in the state would kill to have 66 percent. I know. Voter approval. So I want to move on to something else. Weight. Yep. Fat. Yeah. The final frontier. Right. <laughs> I have had, as many people have, struggles with weight my whole life. And I remember very vividly one time when I went on this exercise uh, program, a whole bunch of us guys threw in a thousand bucks a piece. We thought we really needed to have some skin in the game, literally. And we went on a six week crash course, right? And I got down to, you know, I'm six foot tall. I got down to about 222 pounds. And I thought that was pretty damn good. I was wearing a 44 suit. You know, I was feeling good. I worked my butt off for six weeks. And I'll never forget, I went to see a doctor to get a physical. And he was dictating it to his dictaphone. He says, I have a six foot male in here who's obese. (laughs) You know, and I had just gotten down to the lowest weight that I had been in so long. And I'm trying to get down there again. So you just have, uh, you know, had bariatric surgery three months ago, and how's that going for you? I can tell by looking at you, you're svelte, you're in prime fighting weight, you're looking good. Well, but tell me what the experience uh, has been like. By the <laughs> way, you can see a picture of him on our blog at newstalkkgvo.com. Okay, he's, right? look, he's so, looking. Yeah, you know, he's he looks dapper. great. Yeah. Well, you're 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 very kind. You also have a low standard. And I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, yeah, so you know, I, I have generally. Um, I have generally declined uh, to spend much time talking about this um, for a number of reasons, um, but I'm happy to talk today about it a little bit. One is w- one of the reasons is that um, it is sort of my personal struggle, and what I don't, I, I never want people to be under the impression that someone who is obese, in my case, morbidly obese, is somehow not capable of doing their job or is somehow um, is less of a person, right? right? I, I don't... I, I you, yeah, Some people would view it as a weakness because you can't keep your weight under control. Right. But as we know, it's um, the number one New yeah. Year's resolution by everyone every but, single year. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's it's a disease. Yeah. It's like, it's like you know... Other, it's like addiction of some sort. Right. It's a disease. It's like it's, you with kosher hot dogs. It's like me with kosher hot dogs <laughs> or chauffeur salami. Yeah. <laughs> but it might not. But isn't that? I mean, it is what that is. So, what it is. Yeah. So I can tell you that I began. I, I began to struggle with my weight when I was about twelve years old. I am now fifty-one years old. Uh, I lost my first hundred pounds when I was nineteen. Uh, I probably lost. Well, I, I, I gained all of that back 
during my 20s and more and lost it again and gained it back and more and lost it again and I I did the math one day and I I believe that most likely in my adult life um, I have lost and gained about a thousand pounds at my heaviest <clears throat> this time around I, I just had a checkup yesterday at my heaviest this time around um, uh, I had lost a little bit bit of weight before I visited the surgeon. Uh, that was, uh, I weighed 447 pounds. I go six, two. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, and you didn't pick a career in WWE or I, anything I, like that. I so. did not. Yeah. So I'm not diabetic. Um, I, I, for a 51 year old guy with my job, I don't suffer from hypertension mm-hmm. much. Amazing. Uh, um, I, I am unfortunately a bit arthritic, um, but I found that you know, I just, I just didn't feel good. And and when you're that big, you just, in my case, you just don't feel good. You don't breathe. You don't move. You ache. <coughs> and I love my work. And I am happy to say, in the eleventh year of serving as Missoula's mayor, I still love the work, and I learn something every day, and I want to have the energy to do it correctly. Um, and I've got, you know, you've got kind of a funny curve here. So I was, I was forty when I started this job, right? And I'm not today. So I've got this graph that age right. is going up, um, and weight was going up at the same time, and they were both dragging me down. And so long conversations. I have a great physician. Um, uh, HIPAA only works one way, and I'm happy to out him. Uh, Michael Caldwell is a great family physician. I consider him a friend. Um, um, and he has helped me uh, try to figure this out through diet, through exercise. We tried mm-hmm. it all, and we finally said, let's look at an option here. Um, bariatric surgery, I suspect, is not for everyone. The, the surgery I had is uh, called a sleeve gastrectomy uh, through about six holes in my abdomen. Uh, uh, doctors uh, Brad Picard and Charlie Swanick. Um and you had it done here in I town? Had, mm-hmm. I had okay. it done at St. Pat's. At St. Pat's, yeah. okay. Yeah, and uh, um, the docs, um, through uh, these small incisions, went in and am- amputated uh, 90% of my stomach and stitched mm. it up and uh, pulled that 90% out of a hole. And I woke up about three hours after going down. Uh, and uh, my stomach was mostly gone. Uh, I ate a popsicle, oddly enough, Mm -hmm. um, because through a drain that was in my side at that time, you can tell if there's a leak, because the purple popsicle will start leaking (laughs) out the side of your body, Um, and I didn't have a leak. And the next day, I was just in the hospital overnight. The next day I had a... uh, The next day I had a... uh, um, uh, uh, an x-ray uh, while drinking uh, radioactive formula just to check for leaks and there were none um, uh, in, in in what can only be um, sort of a, a victory dance for a middle aged man um, the only demand of me before I left was that I break wind um, and <laughs> hey you could do it here in the studio it's a gift. <laughs> that's one really? of our demands yeah. Like, like, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. not until I leave before you leave like, <laughs> like it's even voluntary for that's me right. anymore um, and and we we did that and um, the recovery apart from I, I couldn't take uh, I couldn't take anti-inflammatory so I was really um, I had a really difficult time getting around for a while mm-hmm. uh, but uh, today I weigh uh, uh, 291 pounds. Wow, um, fantastic! And uh, feel pretty amazing. So, what's the end strategy? What happens when you get down to your, you know, the the weight range well, that you want to be? So, I will confess. I will confess. You know, my my joy and biggest fear. Um, it. This is a tool, like every other tool, right? right? And and. Um, a gifted eater can get past this thing. You can grow. Right. I see you, you can got gr- that Fitbit on your. You wrist. can grow your stomach, right? Right. Um, you can drink milkshakes. You can get the calories some other way. 
Um, and I, again, have gained and lost and gained and lost. Right. And so I would, um, you know, the, doc, the docs and I are talking about if I went around 250, that'd be a pretty healthy weight for me. Um, I am, my male modeling days are over. Um, Shucks. What are you feeling? It's surprising. So you're feeling good. You got good energy. Are you, are you more, obviously, are you more active now? Are you working I, I out? I can be more active. Right. Um, I am not a big fan of winter, <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I love to walk. And so um, as, as... You get out and see your constituents, yeah, you know, wander the as neighborhood. We, as weather gets a little bit better, it's going to Hiking be... Hiking too? Yep. Yeah. So, but you're not going to... Yeah. They're not going to be... So not, I live in the Rattlesnake and I have great access to our trail system. Sure. And I have dogs who like to walk. They're and, not going to give you the 90% back though, right? Uh, you, you know, I had suggested we put it on eBay just to see. Just to see. You never um, know. But apparently the, there's <laughs> something about that. Does the urge to eat less, is, uh, how, does it, how does it change your behavior? Or, uh, meaning you have 90% you less You have more time. You don't have to be sitting around eating. <laughs> well, there's that. Yeah. So, so how does it work? So oddly, um, in, in my case, and I'm told this is unusual, um, I am hungry all the time. Okay. I, and and I my, you know I call it head hunger. My desire to hit the buffet has not gone away, uh, but my ability to eat much right. is gone. So um, I eat I eat uh, I eat foods that are high in protein, high in nutrient value. Um, I eat very little in the way of carbohydrate, uh, uh, and I am I am physically. Uh, uh, sated um, pretty quickly. Good. Yeah, I mean, I've got a you know the basically this my stomach is a sleeve that is an extension of my esophagus. Right. This is like a paleo diet that he's on. It's kind of paleo. I guess it. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's well, they're, he's they're the all paleo trans. kind of guy. Yeah. So it's the right diet. So I want. You. So I want thirty grams. Of, you know, I want actually I want about seventy grams of protein <laughs> a day, according to my doc. Um, part of that's a protein shake. I mean, I need to make sure that I get all the other vitamins sure. and minerals, etc. cetera. Right. Um, but I don't feel um, so much of, for me, so much of um, eating is habit. And, you know, I don't, as I, right. as I tell people, I, I'm, I'm really running low on vices. I quit drinking in, <laughs> in 2010. Um, I, um, I start now. You know, I was, <laughs> I was always afraid of the munchies. Um, so, right. so that's out. Yeah, right. Uh, There's nothing left for us guys except right. fishing, movies, right. and comic books. F- for me, it's, for me, it's, um, for me, what's left is, uh, <laughs> is variations on coffee drinks. Yes. So, yeah. Or tea. I I mean, it's a tea town. Dairy? So Did you tea. cut dairy out? You know, I, I, I can and do um, eat cheese, substitutes. and I love it. Well, yeah. well they're good yeah, substitutes. Like so there's almond milk. There is... Oh, you know, yeah. I, d- I don't have to do that. Dr. So, Scott, so Dr. I Scott. not to. Yeah. Dr. Scott here will prescribe yeah. you. I'm, lact- I'm not lactose intolerant, and frankly, because I'm the mayor of Missoula, I'm not intolerant in any way. <laughs> That's Scott. right. No, you're a very yeah. tolerant mayor. Let me, let me, let me, oh, well, first I want to say I appreciate you sharing that with, yeah, that's with really, us. A lot of people great. would, and curious minds want to know, and now you've, you've given us what we want to know, and, uh, well, it's we, one of those deals, and, and, we want to cheer you on. And I never, you know, part of Absolutely. this is, is I have, um, you know, I, uh, so many people have so many challenges in this world, and the, and the beauty of, the beauty and the and the and the the curse of the job is that I I see a lot of human suffering and mine uh, pales in comparison. Um, yeah. It is what it is, um, but there are so many people who have so much going on, so much to overcome. And uh, my deal is, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a privileged person um, with uh, with a. Um, good salary and good insurance. Yeah, well, and, and you're you know you're mayor of one of the top twenty cities, small towns in America by almost every poll. Every time there's a poll right. that comes out that says twenty best places to live, twenty best, you're it. People, your, your town is here. Yeah, people love the place, and, and it, for good reason. That's true. Let me let me switch gears a little bit yep. here on you. I remember when you were a journalist, editor at the paper. You wrote a very funny column. So what happened with that? Did you think politics would be more funny, more entertaining than being a newspaper journalist? So I often I often tell people uh, my last boss at the Missoula and I had a fundamental disagreement. Uh, I wanted to work there and he didn't want me to. Um, we had it, you know. I I, I I think you can best describe, I, I think you can best describe it as. Um, 
as uh, downsizing. So I wanted to be a newspaper publisher. That was my right. You went to you went to UM for journalism. Right. Yeah, I had a degree in journalism. I worked on um, I worked on the production side to make my way through school. Uh, when I graduated, applied for a job on the news desk, got that, worked on the editorial side, had written a column for a long time. Um, there was some desperation for a youthful voice, and I used to be youthful, apparently. <laughs> um, so I started writing a column for him when I was 17, and I continued that for a number of years. The great column. Um, you were here, but it's funny. And what, was the, what was the bend? Of, what was the... Uh, it was kind of whatever, right? Uh, um, kind of uh, like the show. Yeah, a little bit. Everybody would eat Luca fish or something <laughs> exactly, like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you were like the Larry King of... Oh, movie. no, I was not the Larry King of anything, <laughs> um, oddly enough. I was, um, you know, sort of, well, sort of a poor man's uh, Dave Barry, oh, okay. Garrison King. Healer type. Mike Royko. Yeah. Mike Royko in Missouri. Far less hard hitting, yes. I'm afraid. In <laughs> fact, not hitting at all, generally speaking. But, um, so I did that. Um, and and then I went then I went to work on the production side of the newspaper. And, you know, at that at that time the publisher's gig was really interesting. Um, it, you, you had a leadership role in the community. I think it was a um, you had some sure. staying power if you were decent at it. And you know, newspapers at that time, God, the margins were forty percent. It was mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it was uh, literally a license to print money. Um, but uh, there was a change in structure. It made uh, apparently no sense for me to remain in my current position. Uh, so I am, I guess, mid-30s. Um, uh, making more money than I ever imagined I would make, which wasn't a great deal of money. It was like 50,000 bucks, but that was good money back then sure. and good insurance. And, um, and I was sort of given a choice to, you know, kind of, um, move out of the position I had because, um, it was, uh, no longer necessary, um, and sell ads. And it's not that I wasn't I would, I, I would have been fine doing that, but that wasn't my chosen vo vocation. Uh, so I resigned. Um, Moved under the bridge. Painted the house for about 18 months, and my wife suggested, yeah, get work, please. Yeah. Really? Please get some please. work. Um, so I... Um, I ended up doing some some freelance stuff for myself. Ended up where I worked for for Vans for a short time. They had a uh, um, at a time they, they wanted to do um, kind of an advertising and media company, mm -hmm. and I worked for them for a time, and then moved on and really just went into my own business. We called it Engen Creative, um, and I did advertising, public relations stuff. I did graphic design because I had some of those skills as a function of my work at the newspaper, which was such a great job. I loved, you know, I loved the newspaper culture. I loved the role of newspapers. Um, you know, every and time there's a movie about, you know, newspapers, Spotlight mm -hmm. or yeah, Press, right. you want to go see. I want to go see because yeah. it, it is a fascinating culture. The, the news business. It is, and I had I had really good friends. Um, at, at the newspaper, the editorial side was, you know, you you had you had cynics and lunatics and true believers and um, savants and and that was just at the coffee shop before <laughs> right. you got to work. Right. Well, you reflected right <laughs> yeah. the uh, fabric of the community, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it was it was fascinating, but 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 I mean, to a person, um, there was there was a commitment to community, and I think. You know, that commitment to community um, that I learned both as a journalism student, um, because I, I think I had a great journalism education and a great education really that prepared me for the work I do today. This is, um, you know, my work is um, I am a generalist, right? Right. I, I have to know a little about a lot and, and occasionally I have to do a deep dive um, to catch up to ensure that I'm doing my job correctly and making good decisions. But um, I learned to ask questions. I learned to be curious. Um, I learned to be skeptical, which is different from cynical. And right. one of the things I always tell you know, my staff and colleagues and constituents is that I, you know, I reserve the right to be skeptical, but the day I'm cynical, I just, I have to quit. You don't, politicians, public servants, mayors, you don't get to be cynical because people deserve more Not than that. Not unless you're running for president in 2006. Well, that, that, yeah. <laughs> That's a good segue. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Let me ask you this. I, I've worked in a company town before. I worked in Middletown, Ohio, where there was Armco Steel. I worked in uh, Oxford, Ohio, which is Miami of Ohio University. Um, how hard is it to do your job in an independent way when there's a 2,000-pound gorilla 
in the same feeding space when you have the University of Montana here in a town this size? <laughs> you know, I've never thought about it as a 2,000 pound gorilla. I've been described as that myself <laughs> occasionally. Um, you're not so, going to be able to do that for much longer. Well, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Be a for, for, <laughs> fortunately, I have so many flaws, Scott, that um, it, I, you know, my my self-deprecating <laughs> shtick can move from fat to any of a variety of neuroses and weaknesses. Oh, well, so, we're all like that. that's good. Yeah, I got. Um, so I will tell you that I have a um, I enjoy a great relationship today with um, Roy Singstrom. He's somebody I respect and appreciate. Um, he's got you know I yeah, there's sort of this long list of. Um, jobs that I'm glad I don't have. And I occasionally hear people say, you know, I wouldn't be mayor for all the tea in China or you right. trot out the right. cliche. I happen to love the job. I try to do it in a way that folks, pardon me, I try to do it in a way that folks um, think that, wow, he looks like he's having fun. Maybe it would be a fun job to have. Right. Uh, maybe it's rewarding. Um, Royce, you know, Royce has lots of... Um, well, not unlike my job, you have a lot of you have a lot of responsibility, very little control, um, and a lot of accountability. But what what Royce and I have been able to do is figure out ways to communicate, and there are lots of ways for us to cooperate. And I think over time. Um, I mean, when when University of Montana can kind of move past some of the sort of crisis management, and, right? And you know, a lot of that is, um, God love him, he's he's had sort of crisis de jour, you know, Ongoing. during during the better part yeah. of his um, his administration. But has um, I, I think the dust will settle and there will be opportunities. I think universities and cities should plan together. Um, and we've talked about transportation in in particular around that, but there, and, and we're doing some How work. So? How um, so? Uh, transit, for example, mm -hmm. parking, uh, connectivity, trails, um, uh, and so we're talking about you know there there's a ASUM has a bus system, we have a bus system. Um, where is there overlap? Where are there opportuni opportunities to cooperate? Right. You know, are we buying fuel in the in the right way? Are we buying buses in the right way? Are we adjusting routes? accordingly, et cetera. Um, you know, we do parking management. They do parking management. Does it make sense that we have two agencies doing that work? Sure. Um, I think that um, housing is another critical area where we can work together. And what I'd like to do over the course of, you know, 2016 is um, – sort of try to address um, housing policy soup to nuts in Missoula, and that ranges from student and faculty housing to senior housing mm -hmm. to low, low income housing to uh, uh, housing for folks who um, are never going to get fixed by uh, addiction treatment. I mean, I believe that we continue to have a responsibility to folks. Um, and in fact, what I'm going to propose to the Missoula City Council is that uh, the city of Missoula adopt a resolution of a policy um, stating that it is, it is a basic human right for folks to have safe, decent shelter in Missoula, Montana. And that matters not whether you got a plug nickel in your pocket and you're right. high as a kite or you're a gajillionaire. Um, so I can move into your house pretty soon now and you, pick up uh, residence? Anytime, Arnie. <laughs> anytime. Um, there's always an extra bedroom for you. And an arm guard. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, so, uh, but, but, but universities and, and communities can work together on those issues as well. We've done really well working together. You know, the sexual assault stuff that we worked through together, sure. um, that, was, um, that was certainly painful. But I believe that the city of Missoula and our police department is, um, uh, we, are a, we are a better place for, um, for women and other victims of, or potential victims of sexual assault. Um, we um, are a better police department because we treat victims uh, with uh, uh, greater respect. Mm -hmm. um, we are in a better position through our training to solve crimes, to bring perpetrators to justice. Um, and I think that 
Um, that translates into good work that's been done on the part of the university um, with regard to its public safety personnel, its policies and practices, its um, its education of students, faculty, and staff. Um, so there are lots of ways to work together. I always say, I repeat it every time I'm in a room with Royce and we're speaking together, the University of Montana and Missoula are inextricable. Um, right. One doesn't exist without the other. So um, there is no... Re- interwoven. Absolutely. And there is no reason for us not to embrace each other. Um, I, you know, I'm a product of that university. I had a great education um, and it was cheap. I have a, back to public safety for a second. What, what do you think we could do better? Right. What could we do better as a community to make it even a safer community? With regard to public safety, um, you know, we are we are blessed. Um, and again, I've I've had I've had the experience of uh, managing uh, uh, a police force with uh, three chiefs. Uh, I have um, I have. Uh, dealt with um, difficult situations with officers who, um, uh, in one case, we had an officer who ended up in federal prison. Uh, We've had some disciplinary problems, um, and certainly we had the sexual assault issue, but I I tell you that um, to a person, we have... Um, at last count, I believe we had 103 sworn officers mm. at the Missoula Police Department. And to a person, those women and men get up every day uh, committed to serving their community. Um, and uh, I have a responsibility to ensure that those folks are uh, accountable, but they largely make it easy. And we, properly resourced. Yeah. And, and we don't have, I mean, we don't have, <clears throat> we don't have a police force um we, we train well, we mm-hmm. train relentlessly. Um, it is an extraordinarily difficult job. And, sure. and it gets more difficult. Particularly in a college town. It, Come on, you got a disproportionate number well, of people. Well, in a town people. of transient, well, yeah. you're on I-90 here. It, There's it so much gets, coming in and out of here. It's very yeah. tough. And it just, it, it, gets increasing, it gets increasingly difficult. So here, you know, so here's what, here's what, um, most citizens, and I don't pretend to be a police officer, and I, I will never be in a position to cross the thin blue line, right? But I work closely enough with these men and women to understand that they see things on a semi-regular basis that you and I never want to see in our lives. We see, they see, they see kids who are abused and uh, misused they and domestic dispute they see, they see the ugly they see the ugliest parts of right. who we are as a society um, they see it relentlessly um, and they swore they swore to they swore an oath to figure it out right and to do their jobs and it's really tough and um there are folks, though, who are cut out for it. There are folks who can make careers of it. There are folks who can maintain their um, composure and professionalism and enthusiasm for the work over mm-hmm. time. And we have lots of them, and they are really admirable. Um, we have a great police chief who is open and thoughtful. Um, we just had another conversation just this morning. We're always talking about how we deploy resources. We're always talking about um, what needs to happen in terms of staffing, what needs to happen in terms of um, uh, addressing sort of broader issues. We have trends that sort of come and go. Um, th- there's a bunch of meth around again. Right. Um, and so we're dealing with that. Right. And you what, might see some trends. I mean, heroin's popular in some states. Hero- yeah, right. Heroin, heroin's big in Missoula. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort shocking. of surprising. And, yeah. and, and, Description and, drugs. And, and the consequences of that stuff are the consequences of that play out in the community. And again, we tend to be in our bubbles, right? Right. Um, and, and so some of it goes, some of it goes sort of missed or ignored. Um, our, our folks don't get to do that. So we're paying attention. They're seeing ugly stuff. They also get to do some fun stuff, but um, it's tough work. Yeah. Yep. So let me, we're in the, even though it seems like it's been going on for years now, we're at the beginning of the campaign for the leadership of the free will. The first primary is coming up very shortly. 
You know, in this campaign, in my eyes, and I've been around politics longer than you have, although not in elected capacity, you know, the campaign has deteriorated into a crusade where, to me, facts and thoughtfulness are demonized, right? Yeah. And crudeness and mean-spirited attacks are glamorized. What's your take on all this? Well, I, I, you know, I agree with you. Um, and, you know, it, it's... I, 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 frankly, I'm not sure how you. I'm not sure how you turn the tide today at the national level. Um, but it also filters down. You're going to see it filter down to the governor's race in the state. Yep. Wherever yeah. you heard it, it's going to filter in congressional races. Uh, it's clearly uh, the mantra now of the of the political realm to get crude, you know, ugly, uh, mean spirited as a way of conducting politics. It is and and substance and dialogue and thoughtfulness right. is, uh. is 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 not only. A shoot, it's almost looked down on. Secondary, like. yeah. Well, yeah, and and so so thank heavens we <coughs> we still have local politics, and and you know my friend Pat Williams, you know, often says all politics are local. You know, you're on the front lines. Um, there's a lot of truth to that. So I've run for mayor three times. Um, the first time we had a we had quite a primary field. Um, uh, a lot of interesting folks. Um, it never, uh, um, it never got ugly. Um, second time I ran undeposed, right? Really wasn't ugly. Um, I criticized myself a bit, but um, uh, you know, threw some mud at myself. Uh, but no, it wasn't ugly. Um, last time I ran, uh, had four opponents, three or four opponents. Um, People in Missoula have an expectation that you talk about issues and stuff that matters to Substantive, them. Substantive, right? Yep. And um, and when you veer off, I mean, when you veer from that, it it sounds goofy, um, and and doesn't make a whole great deal of sense. But it's it's you know you get to these higher levels where you're the the more you the more removed you are from your constituency, I think the the, the more potential for that kind of ugliness, but you look at um, you, you look at my friend Steve Bullock, um, who recognizes this issue at the state level, and I think a lot of folks at the state level recognize it. And I'm hoping we'll start to see a little bit of a change. I mean, clearly the money that's involved in politics is um, is enormous. I mean, that it's what makes you loud, right? Sure. The more the more you got, the louder you are. Well, they're going to spend billions on the president. Right. It's it's unconscionable well, right. when you really think about it. Oh, absolutely. So so let me ask you this: right. someday you won't be mayor. Right. Someday you won't be mayor. Hopefully it's some, not because some, some, of, some have suggested tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah. Well, someday. Right. You know, and and when the time comes, do you have aspirations for higher office? I mean, you got to look at some of the candidates that are running out there for Congress, Senate, governor, even for president. And you have to say to yourself, right, in a, the little voice inside, how hard it could it be to do a better job than that? Well, the, yeah, the little voice inside is um, – you got to watch out. <laughs> um, so, so the the reason I the reason I ran for mayor, the reason I have continued to run for mayor, and the reason I get up in the morning and do this job is because fundamentally, I have a chance every day to make a life better. My job as mayor of the city of Missoula is to make lives better. Um, I don't make all of them better every day. Um, I um, some some people get. Um, get hurt in the process um, in ways that I may not anticipate, um, but I'm doing my best every day uh, to move a community forward in a way that makes it safer, better, cleaner, more prosperous, healthier every day. And, and that's whether you sleep on a sidewalk or on a king size bed in a mansion um and at the local level as mayor of the city of missoula i get to do that stuff um it's i think it would be enormously challenging and i respect the people who do it um i think it would be enormously challenging to be a united states congressman right i think it would be enormously challenging to be a united states senator we have people who do it and um, there are some of them I love and admire and have supported over the years. Um, but 
in terms of being able to see a net effect on your community, in terms of being able to work with exceptional people in a place that is beloved by many, um, you can't beat being the mayor of Missoula, right. Montana. So when we talk about higher office, um, to me, we talk about... Pyramid's upside down, yeah, right? You think the higher yeah. office is being mayor. To, to me, we're talking about different office. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm glad folks want to. Do I want to ask work. John who he's uh, who's he who's he supporting? He's, he he supported Obama in 2008, and, and Obama came here and, that and was 12 a, and 12. And 12 was, so got, it was amazing. All right, so we have Hillary, I owe Bernie, Hillary. and O'Malley. I owe Hillary. <laughs> okay, it's Hillary. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What happened to O'Malley? No. Yeah. <laughs> who? Who? Well, Schweitzer I mean, said he supported O'Malley, and he said. You don't always have to support the person that wins. That's what Brian <laughs> he did say. Well, that's I, that's he, right. did. he did say that. My my first presidential election, I voted for Walter Mondale. So, that's what right. do you think, Bernie Sanders? Well, Bernie Where's Sanders? the beef? You remember that? That was the best mm-hmm. line he had in that campaign. I'd like to know what you think of Bernie Sanders, though, and kind of his strategy and how he's been building that. You know, I. Uh, uh, some similarities there there are i mean this 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 sort of grassroots notion i mean so what happens what happens is cynicism right and and we're back to that notion of skepticism versus cynicism and um there, there i think there has been sort of too much um there's been too much deception um and uh corruption and um and goofy rhetoric um people want something different right right that's why you got trump right right so you're yeah gonna get something he's, different he's, with them. he's different yeah and you know and i think you know uh, you know I, I i while i certainly support um hillary clinton she is absolutely the establishment candidate on, right. on my side of the ticket. Um, and and there are lots of people who, um, on either side of the aisle, and that aisle is as weird and as broad as it's ever been, um, who think establishment represents status quo, and they don't want it. Right. They right. don't want it. It's true. It's going to be interesting to see what happens, right? Because Bernie's changing the dial, the conversation, really, and the whole landscape but you that's know. only through the end of the primary season. But when that primary season's over, you're going to see both candidates, whoever they are on both sides of the aisle, go back to the bread and butter kind of rhetoric that, that the think? party stands for. Yes, I like the idea of what he's, he's mobilizing sure. A, sure. A, 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 this group of people that otherwise would not get out. And it remains, it, let's see what happens. Right. But he's mobilizing a group well, of people see that what aren't happens. part of the process. But it is likely it's going to be Hillary Clinton versus probably somebody other than Donald Trump. I just... Don't see Trump making his way through the whole process. Certainly, my hope. Yeah, well, you know, but you, I, I in fact, uh, I was mentioning to the mayor before the show. I, uh, I started using the word trumpery to describe, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Donald's behavior. By the way, he's being savaged by his own party more than even the Democrats. Democrats don't have to say much. <laughs> you just have to listen to what Rubio and oh, yeah. uh, and uh, Cruz and Jeb have to say about him. So I thought that was sort of a made-up word because I don't have the kind of vocabulary that you have. But I went and looked it up in the Webster's and Oxford Dictionary, and there is such a word as trumpery. And the definition is the practice or beliefs that are superficial or visually appealing but have little real value or worth. Show, showy but worthless, deceitful, baloney as a synonym for it. It's a perfect way to kind of describe the candidate and uh, – if you probably told him this and gave him the definition, he would uh, say thank you. <laughs> I think you're right, but you know, I learn something every day in this racket. Trumpery is the it's word a new of the one. day. It's a new word, and it's a, and, and we're moving forward with it. You've already talked a little bit about what you like about the job, and it, it's clear in your voice and your passion and your enthusiasm. There's a lot to like. What don't you like? Uh, I don't like when um, I don't like when you gotta people, come on this radio show. But oh, yeah, yeah. no, it's <laughs> actually been fun. Um, I don't like it when people in my community suffer, and um, uh, the sexual assault stuff was difficult. And knowing that it still goes on is difficult. Knowing that, um, knowing that there are hungry bellies out there, knowing that there are folks sleeping in the cold, knowing that there are people who are um, addicted and mentally ill and don't have access to what they need and not having 
not having figured out a way to crack that case is frustrating for me, and I would like to do more. Um, I, 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 I don't like misinformation. Um, you don't like it, being set up. Sometimes that happens. Well, yeah. I mean, one of the things that happens, for better or worse, is um, we um, we um, be, be, because information is omnipresent and instantaneous. Um, bad information can be omnipresent mm. and instantaneous, and it's really hard to put a genie back in the bottle. Sometimes, um, when well, there are a lot it, of people out. out there when there's articles in the Onion or Andy Borowitz, they believe it's true. Right. They right. don't even understand Question satire. Satire, right. right? Right. They don't. They don't question right. satire. Thankfully, the news cycle is much shorter. Right. The things yeah, dissipate right. a lot quicker. Right. You but know, and sometimes it's about the attention span. Well, right. but the old messages are hard to erase. I mean, for example, they they're are. going to take the folks who have been critical of player. And Planned Parenthood had been indicted by a grand jury. Right. And it's clear that, the, the, you know, what they were doing was, you know, right. illegal and misleading. Right. But it so far hasn't changed anybody's opinion. And who the spin. Against right. Planned Parenthood and the spin. Right. They keep on, you know, sprouting information that's not accurate and not true. I have, I have a, one quick question. Yep. When people talk about bringing business, new business to Missoula, and is Missoula a magnet, um, from an infrastructure standpoint, from a tax standpoint, from a, just a, a general, like, can we bring the oracles to Missoula? Uh how do you answer that? Uh, yeah, so I, I, th- I think I think the potential for that is there. I think I think I think Oracle um, Oracle needs a whole whole big pile of human beings who don't live here. Um, right. I, I think we'd have to be a bigger community for that um, that that sort of uh, business. But um, great places to live are great places to do business. Right. And. We work relentlessly to make this a great place to live and to attract the right kinds of business. And based on what I'm seeing, sort of in the certainly in the commercial sector over time, um, particularly in the last two years, uh, um, what I hear from my folks at the Economic <coughs> Partnership, what um, what we believe, just in general terms, um, we're doing to ensure that we have high quality infrastructure. Um, and infrastructure just isn't. It, it, I mean, it's not just um, it's not just streets and and um, pipes anymore. It's no. it's it's green infrastructure, right? It's it's trails and right. uh, and recreational amenities and parks and schools. And we work pretty consistently as a community on all of those parts. Um, and. Uh, and I think it starts to show. What happens is you look at the coasts, um, and um, this notion, I, I, I can't remember the author's name, but he wrote a book, The Third Coast, right? right. Um, we are a market that is being discovered for um, yes. all sorts of reasons. Um, it is a it is a great place to live, but it's also, Missoula offers city amenities, in a small community, you 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 can see a world class performance at the University of Montana, but you don't have to pay a world class price, wait in a world class line, face right. world, face uh, metro traffic, um, and um, you can take it all in and then still walk down the street the next day and say hi to your neighbor. Yeah. So one last question for yep. me. Your first campaign slogan was "Think Big." It was indeed. I thought it was one of the great slogans of all time in yes. politics. IBM. You can't use that one anymore for a number of reasons. Think, one is right. because you're half a mayor now. You're half size mayor. You can't use that. Do you have a slogan you're thinking about for the next time you're going to run? Uh, you know, so my so my last that was my city council campaign yeah. slogan. Uh, my first mayoral campaign was uh, working together. Uh, last time was. Um, our Missoula, your mayor. Um, next time, I need to run again in 2017. Right. Uh, Not that far off. Uh, maybe maybe it'll be, it's the water. It's the, and a lot it's more. the water. <laughs> <laughs> you can drink the water. How about that? Right. Yeah, As opposed right. to Flint and right. some other places yeah, now. God love them. That's... Tough. Oh God, Mayor Engen, it's been a pleasure. Time Pleasure's goes fast when thank we're, you. Uh, Mayor, when we're talking delightful. with you. Yeah, thank it, you. It has been a delight to speak to you. Hey Scott, one thing before we uh, before we sign off with our uh, listeners: next yes, week Arnie. is Super Bowl Sunday. 
I know. My show will be on Super Bowl. Where are we Sunday. watching the Super Bowl? Where are you watching the Super Bowl? Well, I won't, I won't hate him, unfortunately. <laughs> the ticket prices are a little steep. But we have a great guest next week coming to join us. We have uh, a Grizz favorite, Grizz, uh, you know, Grizz right. All-American, Mark Mariani. Nice. will be joining us on the show. For those of you that almost all of our listeners know who Mark is, but for those that don't, he was uh, All-American here at the University of Montana. He went on to... Uh, play for the Tennessee Titans, uh, and and uh, ended up being a pro bowler. This past uh, two seasons, he's been with the Chicago Bears played as a wide receiver. And we're going to have on him on talking about his Super Bowl predictions, life in the NFL, and uh, you know other insider uh, information as our, uh, as our guest for the 50th Super Bowl next Sunday. I can't wait. Great guest. I mean, you are just a fountain of great guests. Well, Mayor John Angus, Mark to beat Mariani. John. It's, hard, it's hard to beat his. Honor. I know, but I love that. I think it's great. It's great for our community. No. Again, John, thank you very much for being here. Yeah, you've been My delightful. Pleasure, thank gentlemen. you, Mayor. Thank Angie. you. All right, you're listening to What Do You Know on KGVO. We'll see you again next week with Mark Mariani.